All right, not only during the demo compo. Okay, so um, encryption and the world of Pac-Man. Uh, this is a small seminar I create, and I usually bring in hacker spaces um, on uh, arcade games, how they are bootlegged, how they are copied, uh, and what every company, the Segas and Nintendos of this world, did to prevent this. I uh, usually start with introduction of who I, who I am. I come from Belgium, I work in IT, I, have pl I spent too much time in the 80s, so basically C64 guy. I sell arcade cabinets, I play pinball machines. Um, everyone who can beat my hard score on the machines at the info desk gets a beer from me. Currently Corvette 1.3 billion and scared stiff, I just played I think 37 million, so have fun. And oh, uh, I'm also the main compo organizer here, so um, if, your compos, if the compos go wrong, it's not my fault. Okay, and I suck at PowerPoint. This is, yeah, this is, a, to this is a, a basic team I found in the office installation. So anyway, bootlegging. Um, bootlegging or is the overall world of copying arcade games. Um, term is copied from the uh, concert scene in the 1670s with bootleg tapes. That's where it comes from. If you hear me say bootlegging, it means illegal copy. Um, now, it, it is all, always the why. Well, first of all, it's, it's very easy. It's for people who want to make money uh, very easy, uh, doing li very little R&D, um, or they want to sell um, copies of the game with just basic piracy, on a, but not with floppy disks, but with uh, PCBs. Um, you can also go for lazy R&D. They said, well, okay, some company made a very nice platform. I can do something with it. Um, but still, I'm lazy, so um, I'll just write my own game. I know how the CPU works, I know how the sound works. Um, I can do that. So, and also cheap upgrades. If you, uh, for instance, have, have a game um, and a new game comes out but is the same platform, well, you can just swap the ROM chips and have a new game at the price of four or five empty ROMs which you have burned. But I want to start with a game. Which game is this? Um, Diana Sisters is a, has a horizontal screen layout. This is vertical. So it's a side scroller. No. So okay, I heard Pac-Man. Okay, right. Which which one is this? Pac-Man. Okay. Which one is this? Pac-Man. Nope, it's not. Pac-Man Jr. No. Mrs. No, no, because Mrs. Pac-Man has a little uh, tie up her hair, and it's and, and actually Game the Man. and actually and actually the grid in Mrs. Pac-Man is pink. Gay man. No, because this is gay man, <laughs> and it's even French gay man because it says pre, not ready. So, in general, I guess it's right that you guessed it wrong. You have been seeing Hangley Man, New Puck X, New Puck 2, and Scandal Man. <laughs> Why Scandal Man says pre instead of ready? I don't know, because Scandal Man doesn't really sound good to me in French. And it can go even stranger. This comes into the uh, lazy R&D department that um, they throw away everything except the artificial intelligence. They throw away the spies. They throw away the background graphics. And you get things like this. Yeah, um, I think the, the one on the right is called Piranha. I have seen one copy once uh, in, I believe, um, Santa Monica, California, where they had three or four bootlegs next, lined up next to each other in, uh, in an arcade. Um, it plays like shit. So, well, and this is an example of creating new ROMs on an existing platform. So uh, it's the same hardware, you uh, take out the ROM chips and put your own in and you sell it as something that looks like Pac-Man but does not have the resolution, does not have the colors, but does have the maze of it. And this is Pac-Man, or what it's supposed to look like. Now, 
Of course, all of this bootlegging is a very bad thing if your name is uh, Sega, Nintendo, Namco, and um, oh, Midway. Um, you want to prevent this, you want to um, start uh, copy protection schemes, you want to put your lawyers on it, um, and of course, the bootleggers get smarter and smarter, uh, which you don't like as well, and then you get eviler and eviler. So they have a few solutions. One is legalese, send in the lawyers. Is Ned Pertle already here? He might enjoy this one. Uh, hardware trickery, software trickery, black blobs, encryption, and suicide. I always save the best for last, hence the suicide. So here, here's the legalese. Um, you have one game, or Pac-Man, as originally called, and you sell it to an other company on another continent in the time that Concord still flew, and you have the lawyers battle it out and transfer your money. What's the problem with this? Come on, open question. Come on. No, nobody cares. Hmm. So, you have the hardware tricks. Um, you put a little IC in the middle, and it changes your banks around. Uh, once, one time you go from bank number one to bank number zero to bank number five, and at the second you miss a certain bank switch, the game will crash because it gets the wrong information. You will, you will suddenly be loading sound data as game data, and the CPU says, I have no idea what to do with this, and it just halts. This is uh, a scheme just to copy basic ROMs, because uh, arcade games are, all, are always built on a platform. You try to reuse it, it saves money. And uh, people quickly found out that, well, I, I can have this racing game, and then I have this shooting game, and I can just cop uh, can take the ROMs out and plug them in, and hey, I have a new game. If you don't copy the uh, security chip, or in this case, the Atari Slapstick, as it's called, as an example, um, your game doesn't work because each game uh, requires its own slapstick. Now you can get around this. Because as you know the CPU, you know its memory map, which gives you a way to start. The, the ROMs are unencrypted, so you can just read them so you know what's going on. You can see at which time the CPU triggers the specific bank and uh, reads the specific data. And then you can emulate this. It will take some time, but um, Cheap, cheap reverse engineering in Asian countries is not, was not uncommon, it's, it's still not uncommon, uh, and happens. So that's, that's how you get around the hardware tricks. You got the software tricks as well. This is mostly for um, consoles and um, systems which work with, with cartridges. You know that your system is a, a ROM system. You cannot write through it. So as your copy protection, you um, write to certain memory addresses and you expect an error. If you do not get an error message, you know, hey, I can write to ROM, which is not good, so I can, this is RAM I am writing to, hence I am a copy and I stop. Just emulate it. But it's, it's, a, it's, it has been tried a couple of times, mostly on home consoles, like your Nintendo's, uh, NES's and Mega Drive's, uh, Etc. Et they, ha they have some very basic system like this. Um, it hasn't been used much, but it exists. Then we come to um, the black blobs, which um, ooh, I beat. Which um, is that you create your own CPU, you put in your own ROM, you put in your own RAM, and you remove every marking of it and you put it on your PCB game. Of course, you put it smack in the middle of your data bus so that it controls it. And, well, you do, you do not know what's going on. There, there, there is no code, there is no data um, coming, out of the, uh, coming out of this chip. It's, it reads the bus on one side and exits on the other side. But what's going on in the middle, you don't know. Now, have a guess from which game this is. It's not Pac-Man. Bubble Bobble, indeed. Actually, it took very long before Bubble Bobble was properly emulated in MAME, specifically because of this chip. Uh, every emulation that you had in MAME of Bubble Bobble was uh, of a bootleg. 
where they reverse engineered this specific chip, but the original one took a very long time and we'll come back to why. And of course, as it's, it's a bootleg, it didn't took, take him long, you get bubble, 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 and super bubble, bubble. Which were all created and you re remove some uh, copyright messages and you sell it for one-fifth of the price on the black market. Yes, the black bubble bubbles in the bubble bubbles, I know. So, here's how you do it. You have somebody who uh, analyzes, analyzes the specific chip, writes down every signal that, that comes out of it, analyzes the inputs, and says, well, okay, if I put this signal on the line, then this comes out, and he kind of emulates it in another system on the chip, uh, writes the outputs, and see what happens. And that's also, if you would look at uh, at the copied version of Bubble Bubble, you will see that the emulated chip here does extreme amounts of unnecessary writes on the system bus. That's how the reverse engineer just say, well, okay, every x milliseconds I need to send out a reset signal, for instance. Um, that's, that, that's how it goes. And of course, as in Bubble Bubble, some of the actual game code, artificial intelligence, how the, how the monsters move, was inside the chip the bootleg was actually kind of a guess. So where in the original your monster would go to the left, the bootleg would go to the right. But um, until like two or three years ago, nobody, nobody really noticed. So how do, you, how do you do get it? You find an original PCB on eBay, you pay a lot of money for it, you take out the security chip and you destroy it. You, you take out the cover, you put it under a microscope and bit by bit, you reassemble the, the code, and then you see what it, what it actually is. And then the, the emulation guys from the main project found out that it was a C801 CPU, and actually quite a lot of security code wasn't even activated. Um, why, you would have to ask the guys from Taito. Maybe they couldn't get it to work, we never tested it. So now we get to encryption. You encrypt your ROMs. You need your decryption key, and of course you do not store it in ROM. You keep it inside the CPU. You make inside your CPU, you make a special design of it. You have a small decoding algorithm and the key. Um, when the data arrives at the CPU, it gets decrypted and put into RAM to put on the display or any other device that, that you need. If you don't have the de decryption keys, you, you will see garbage on your screen. Some examples here where some sprites are clearly not decrypted. CPU says, well, I have no idea what this is and just shows blank memory data. Um, this was mostly in the late 90s used. Um, some algorithms today are still not even decoded. That's well after 15, 20 years of usage, which means that um, if we cannot decode this data, if we cannot find out the algorithm or the key, at some point this thing will, this, this information will be lost. Um, it's, um, it's, 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 it's important to people who um, yeah, want to keep everything uh, available for future generations, and it's also fun to play but you can also get around this. If you, today with strong CPUs and everything, we can do real-time uh, decoding. You can take your ROM image or your ROM chip, put an in-between uh, in between on the bus, and you brute force it. Um, and you will always find certain special um, text data. You will get, you, you will see somewhere Sega, Nintendo, Namco, you will find it, and when you have a human readable text, you know, well, I'm probably pretty close, I'm on it. And then you can take that data. But this is um, really um, on the fly. The retro gaming helps here. Why? Because you have all these um, classic games collections which come out for the PlayStation and for the Wii and for the Xbox and they play the original arcade games, which means that they must contain the original decryption keys and the original algorithm. 
And usually, a Wii disc or an Xbox disc or PlayStation disc is way easier to dump to disassemble, and you can just lift out the algorithm, and then that way you can brute force it in the other direction until again you have um, a human readable um, text. This was the method used for the Pokemon uh, demo, I believe, a couple of years in the Breakpoint Wild, uh, wild Combo, which one? It's, um, it's, it's the same system used. And also, uh, games come in versions. You have bug fixes, you have version one, you have version two, you have new, new features, you have special editions, you have um, still differences between countries. You have a Japanese version, European version, and American version. And sometimes, for one reason or the other, nobody knows, uh, you get an unencrypted set, unencrypted ROM chips. This get, then gives you a delta to start off uh, to decrypt it all and say, for instance, if your European version is encrypted but your American version isn't, then you go looking for differences between the two uh, code bases, the, the, the graphics files, the sound files, and um, start that way to decrypt it. But now we end with suicide. It continues on the encryption method, but the decryption algorithm and decryption key is not in a CPU ROM, but it's in a RAM connected to a battery. If the battery drops under a certain voltage, usually 2.5 volts, the ROM is erased, and your decryption key and your algorithm is lost, and when you start the game, it won't start anymore because the CPU now can no longer decrypt the information which is coming from the ROMs. Back in the days, 15, 20 years ago, you could send your game back for one third of the original um, buying price and you would get a refurbished version with a new battery and which would work again. Of course, the battery would again die after two or three years and you would, you would stick with uh, the problem. Today, you can replace the batteries. Uh, if you can solder them, just don't forget to first solder the new one and then cut out the old one, or, well, your game will be dead. So, again, how to get around this, you come back to the same real-time decrypting. But again, this is a workaround. You are decrypting it on the fly, uh, not uh, you decrypting it in RAM memory. You are not saving it. You are just seeing that you get everything to run. Now, you can, of course, do this off offline. And if you have a ROM set, and you can do this on every chip image you have, you can get a fully decrypted image of your game, your, your data, your sound. And this method then, you have a set of keys, which are then also used on other games. So let's say, um, for instance, you could have a Street Fighter uh, 2 and a Street Fighter 2 Plus. Uh, if you could decode Street Fighter 2, chances are good it might work on Street Fighter 2 Plus. It might not, but you can try. You have an entire list of games which are uh, encrypted. You have your base and you just see what happens. Sometimes um, the developers were lazy and they reused, reused encryption keys after uh, a couple of months or a couple of years. And then once you have it decrypted, you can burn these ROMs to actual chips, these images, and it might, um, oops, that's me, it might um, uh, help to revive your dead game. It's like playing a zombie. And I'd like to end with some completely weird, weird stuff which I found in pinball machines, and it exists in pinball machines. Um, what they did here was, um, a microcontroller sits on the motherboard and holds the type of game. Every game has a, has a type number. Say, um, the one in, in front, uh, Corvette might be at number 500. It has on it a microcontroller that says, I will only start with ROM chips, which are labeled with number 500 as well. Why? Uh, to, to sell spare parts. What, pe what owners would do is they have 
two games, two different games. One is broken, and they say, well, I can use the old one and use the PCBs and the sound card and the CPU card in the other one because the platforms will match, and then they will work. Not anymore, because uh, then the company which sells them can no longer sell you a spare part. And this is, uh, ex this is more, uh, this becomes more clear because the ROMs are totally unencrypted. They, they don't put any copy protection on it. It's just a way to annoy the owners of the machines, the operators who put them in, in, in bars and cafes, to buy spare parts if, some, if, if something dies. Now, of course, we can create fake serial numbers today. You have the game ID, 559, then a serial number which we just made up. This is now coming out of the world of uh, pin main, pin mail emulation, but it also helps um, the home users because now we can change this microcontroller or pick PIC to be more lean on how it uh, accepts and uh, deals with uh, different game types. Uh, we can also create universal ones, which, which, which will just work. The function of it is, yeah, it's like a little bit of a postman. It sits in between the input signals and the output signals, and is a general director. So they again looped the entire system bus and data bus through it, so to be sure that uh, the game wouldn't work if this specific component was missing. Um, you can also because then the check if the chip is correct is done in the ROM, in the, in the unencrypted software part. So you can just mop out the copy protection and say, well, I will run anyway. And you can then burn that uh, image to your ROM chip and put it in the machine. And most of it is done through uh, pin MAME in the last three to four years when the PCs got uh, strong enough uh, that they could uh, emulate the, the 3D and the pinball uh, things. and. Uh, the, the physics of ball movement. You can download the slide later if you want. <laughs> but still, bootlegging exists today. Three examples here that basically this is uh, a slide saying to all the guys at Namco, Nintendo, Sega, Midway, saying you failed. We do whatever we want and whatever happens, you cannot start bootleggers. You have um, small PCBs which, which combine games. Um, the, these are clearly Chinese products, else you wouldn't call it the Happy Fish 302. Um, it, it has all the uh, SNK Neo Geo games. You have the 61 vertical games, which is mostly Z80 based. You have all the uh, uh, Pac-Mans, Dig Dugs, uh, Frogger is on there. It's all semi-based around the same architecture. and. You also have uh, emulation boards which uh, emulate the Capcom games. And Capcom was notorious for using suicide batteries. So, so these have all been bypassed. And now basically when people, uh, so um, many Capcom games on the second market aren't that ported much anymore because the first question is, did you remove the battery? If you say no, then well, the game will, will, will be dead because it's 10 years old. So there goes your value. And people then buy uh, emulation boards anyway. Now, I didn't make all of, all of this up. I have some references. Um, I'll make this slide, slide available. Uh, you can download the video, um, etc. But usually, I end with questions. So shoot. Or is it all too complicated? I don't know. Sorry, uh, there's a microphone coming over. Where can I buy this uh, Neo Game emulation boards? Is uh, uh, yes, you can. You can. You can buy them at your uh, favorite Chinese reseller. Okay, I have to look for it. Okay. Okay. Um, what you also can do is, you can buy a one-slot Neo Geo um, uh, board, and then um, put in a 100 in one, 150 in one cartridge in it which will have most of the games. Not all of them, but most of them. Any other questions? Come on, I took out half the time for this.
So I heard that there were uh, standard uh, chips, uh, copy protection chips on NES modules. How do these relate to uh, your scheme? Um, the NES chips would be comparable to the um, Atari slapstick, I, I, I believe. I'm not an expert on, on, on NES, but um, it's also um, it's a pin, pin rebooting and some um, de decoding of addresses, I, I believe, which is, uh, which is done there. Anyone else? Okay, well, um, then thank you. I'll be around if you have any further questions. Oh, is there another one? Sure. What up, Jerome? Oh, jij natuurlijk, Whisky. Godverdomme. Als je dat maar weet. Kom maar, kijk dat voor Triple X. Kom maar. Dank je.